for me, it's it's just an ever evolving journey. Like I could see, even if I could like shut down my main channel, sell my data channel, be financially set for life, I still would probably create a new channel on some other random topic that I just yeah. want to go deep on, you know, and just yeah. keep doing that over and over and over again, as long as it's interesting. But knowing now what I know about storytelling and how to create those things, I know that those things are high chance of success. Whereas early on, it's very much you're just wandering through the dark. You don't know if what you're going to do is going to lead anywhere, right? It just feels like you have no idea if you how likely it is you're going to succeed. Uh, but once you've done it a couple times, then you go, oh, okay, here's sort of the formula. As long as I stick to this, eventually I'll find I'll find the light here at the end of the tunnel. Dear friends, Kurt Derdix here. If this is your first time listening, I am so glad you found us. Today, we chat with Ben Solens, founder of Free the Data Academy. Ben and I delve into the intersection of data science, storytelling, and YouTube content creation. And Ben also narrates his transition from data science to becoming a successful YouTuber, shedding light on the pivotal role of storytelling in captivating audiences. This episode isn't just about conversations. It's a symphony of insights, a kaleidoscope of experience that underscores the paramount importance of storytelling in the dynamic realm of data science. And Ben has some really interesting perspectives on sustainability, sovereignty, and energy independence that I so appreciate and am inspired by and hope you are too. So on to today's show. Here's Ben. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, it is Ben Solon. So good to see you, buddy. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. Good. Glad uh, to be here. I, uh, you know, it's it was so fun meeting you um, it, this past Christmas, uh, 2023, in, in your neighborhood, in your hood, in El Cajon, San Diego. And I went, <laughs> I got invited to my uh, cousin Jim Nelson's little Christmas Eve party and and there was this really smart dude and it was you and we were talking and i was like i you know we were talking to money and talking uh investing and and uh yeah. and, and ai and i asked you a question about uh coding and and i was i was absolutely um delighted at the uh kind of the auspicious meeting and just how kind of uh smart and fluent and you and and you're sort of this uh uh, you're in a renaissance man and then i kind of find out you play flamenco guitar and like you yeah. know what, what what don't you do buddy <laughs> <laughs> what don't i do i i don't eat fast food that's for one <laughs> love it uh you know i i try to I, I think life is all about depth and finding that's where the joy comes and so anytime i do anything i try to go to the depths of it i don't skim the surface of it so mm -hmm. uh whether that be you know i my career was in data science for 20 years whether it's something like that or whether it's making content online or whatever so uh i can talk smartly about a few things uh but there's a lot of stuff i don't know anything about and i'm okay with that whereas i think a lot of people want to just kind of dabble and that's just not my personality i'm, I'm yeah. sort of all or nothing yeah i think i'm more of a dilettante than you are i think mm -hmm. you know uh but you know it it takes a village and um i think you know when i learned a bit about your background um i'm looking at your um, linkedin right now you were at mm. um y you have a background in data science um and you were at lynda.com like when it was like a thing back in the day right well, I'm an author that publishes on Linda, but Linda's gone now. So now it's LinkedIn Learning. Yeah. Um, so I started making online courses back in 2013 for Pluralsight, which is uh, similar right. to Lynda.com. Yeah. yeah. And then I joined Pluralsight as the chief data officer. We built a whole uh, office out here in San Diego. The company's from Utah. And we like, you know, had had a big a big thing and then went through some changes. The company grew exponentially. We were one of those unicorn, you know, billion dollar startup type companies. And, you know, what happens in that trajectory is you go from a 50 person company where you can make a difference and you can really like do something to a 500 person company where you're just completely bogged down with politics and red tape and just uh -huh. you feel like you're trying to, you know, uh, run it through quicksand. And so... 
I really like startups. They're so fun because uh, you can really get stuff done and you can make a difference and you can see the results. The bigger the company is, the less fun it is. And I've worked at as big a company as they get and I've worked at really small companies. So that's that was my, my sort of trajectory. So I started making online courses. I met the founder of Pluralsight and he recruited me and I left Mozilla at the time, I was the guys that make Firefox. And I joined them, started an office, did all that. We grew exponentially got too big for my britches and I, I bailed out of there. Uh, I left that job and then I did nothing but make online courses for Pluralsight until they couldn't keep up. And basically they said, hey, cause I mean, if it's my full-time job, I'm making one course a month, you know, and data science stuff. And they just didn't have the staff on their end to keep up. And so I said, well, hey, that's cool that uh, I appreciate you guys, but if you can't keep up, I'm gonna, I still gotta feed my family somehow. And so, um, some of my friends actually had went over to Linda at the time and Linda. So they hit me up and said, we'll sign you for seven courses today and pay you advances tomorrow. Like, let's do this. And so then I switched over to making courses for them. And I think now I have like close to 50 courses on LinkedIn learning. That's amazing. Um, and I just had a call with them last week. We're probably going to do a dozen more this year. And so I have a small team. I really don't like to scale things. I, I like to keep things small because I've worked in big companies and it always sucks. Your job just yeah. becomes meetings and managing people. And that's not fun. I'm a more of a creator. I like to make things that I can see the results of. So yeah, uh, keeping it. it small, but, but, you know, just kind of slowly building over time is the, is the focus. Yeah. There's so much I want to cover with you in the context of the data science bit. You know, you have your, um, your, your YouTube channels and you have your, uh, couple there and um and also just as i'm just personally curious a bit about my journey as an emerging creator and doing content i have so much appreciation for for content creators now doing it like being behind the, <laughs> the mic and uh it's a lot of work and um you know and i'm really really trying to learn a couple things for me is how to be a better communicator and a better storyteller and a better human. And it's wild when I listen back to the, um, the draft of the, you know, episode and give edits and, you know, I've gotten so much better about being able to listen actively. I remember the first year doing it, I was like, there'd be mm -hmm. whole sections of the conversation. My mind would wander and I'm finding that that's a lot less. And, and now I'm getting into a dimension of being able to have more empathy for what the audience might want. So, mm -hmm. Um, I'm curious to, you know, unpack some of these themes about how you think about um, the stories that you tell and, and maybe even using data as a um, as a divining rod, if you will, to sort of sure. uh, find those uh, nuggets. Um, um, I mean, there's there's so much we can cover. Where, where do you think would be a good place to uh, dive in? Or, I mean, well, I think my storytelling method or my creation strategy, whatever you want to call it, um, stems all the way uh, originally from my time in corporate America giving presentations. Um, I was like most people where I would just bullet point out my thoughts and then stand up in front of people and read the bullet points as if they were too dumb <laughs> to read it themselves. Yeah, You know, that's the whole phrase. This could have been an email. Like literally, I just put an email on the screen and read it to you. That's how yeah. stupid meetings for most people still to this day are. Mm -hmm. I went to, um, I found a woman and uh, named Nancy Duarte, who is sort of acclaimed in the corporate world as this presentation guru. And she wrote a book called Slideology. And I think the other one was called Resonate. I forget. But I yeah. went to her two-day on-site training up in Mountain View. And it absolutely changed my strategy and everything in terms of how I give presentations, which I would say is sort of on a spectrum of storytelling you know, maybe at the at the least creative side, you have like a dissertation, you know, like a scholarly article, sure. which is just yeah. all the facts, all the emotions are moved out of it. Only people will read it that are super geeked on that space for whatever reason. And then at the other end of the spectrum is uh, a film, like something you would see in a movie theater, right? Um, and n like a real film, not like a Marvel movie, right? Yeah, but like yeah. a heart, real heart, yeah, heart strings yeah. and all. 
Yeah, so that's the spectrum we're working on. So whether or not you're giving a presentation in your in, in your job, in your marketing meeting, or if you're making YouTube videos or TikToks, or if you're actually making films, we're all doing essentially the same thing. We're trying to get a message across. And so I learned from Nancy Duarte how to sort of structure a presentation in that way. Then I started making YouTube videos, and instead of, like this is what happens as creators, uh, people start making or finding success by creating content, and they start listening to all the content gurus, all the guys that say, do this in your thumbnail, do this for your YouTube video to keep people engaged. And right. it's sort of like tricks or hacks. How do you just kind of trick people into liking it? I yeah. went the other way, and I said, what can we learn about from film? What can we learn from Scorsese or Aaron Sorkin or some of these amazing storytellers is really what they are. Sure, they do it with, you know, this high artsy form, but the same methods are, are, are that they use, we can use as well. So the one that I adopted is probably the most popular storytelling um, structure called the three act structure. And so I sort of combined the three act structure with Nancy Duarte's presentation method to come up with my sort of template for creating content. And it starts, I'll, I'll give you a real brief overview. Stop me if you have questions along the way, but it starts with the main idea. What is the main message you're trying to get across? It could be, uh, this thing sucks, don't buy it. Or it could be, sign up for this, you have to go check it out now. Um, I'll give you an example. Back in April of last year in California, there was new legislation that passed that said if you add solar panels to your home after this point, yep. you are going to get absolutely screwed by <laughs> the tax incentives. So I did a, a several videos. Guys, you must go do this before April 13th or whatever. Otherwise, you're going to get totally screwed. So that's the main idea. Then, you, this is the Nancy Dorte side of it, where is your audience when they start? And then where do you want them to be at the end? So this is your, your end points, right? The bookends sure. of your story. Yeah. Um, they may come in saying, what is this? I don't know, to, oh my God, I gotta go do that, right? That, that's the bookends. And then you have the actual journey. How do you get them from that one to that one? And this is where Nancy Dorte has her method, and I diverge and bring in the three-act structure. If anyone's listening knows this, it's uh, three simple components, your setup, your conflict, and your resolution. Every story, not every story, but a vast majority of movies and everything that you've ever paid attention to uses this exact same structure. Uh, it's also known as the hero's journey, I've heard people yep. call it. Same idea. So all my videos basically follow that structure, and that's the same one that I was using back in my days giving presentations. And I could tell you immediately after I started using this, all like getting my projects approved or getting added budget or new hires or whatever I wanted to do or I felt was necessary in my corporate job, the answer was just yes. And that's how I rose from uh, data geek, just writing code to co spit out reports to the chief data officer of a you know billion dollar tech startup. So it was one of those things where this is such a powerful thing and w yeah, whether or not you're making films or giving a presentation in your next marketing meeting, I think that same concept, that same framework can be used uh, for everybody. I just got the chills. I think you're, this is so bullseye to um, my journey. It, it, it's so resonant. Um, I, I worked for this billionaire for quite a long time named Jack Dangerman at Esri. And I was one of his little protégés and uh, had so much great insight from him. And I, one day I, I got a call from him and he's like, hey, you know, uh, one of my executives, you know, complaining about you, you know, you're causing a bunch of problems, but you know <laughs> what, you're doing a great job. Just stay independent. But he's like, get better at telling stories, mm. you know? And, and I remember being like, what an interesting, like bit of advice. And that was one of the things that lit a fire under my ass to like, really be like, okay, well, you know, if he's telling me this, like I have to reflect and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and then hearing, um, Naval Ravikant, uh, who, who most of us know and love, founder of uh, AngelList, he has mm -hmm. this concept that uh, around leverage. And if you can't code, create content because content's a great, you know, lever. And uh, sure. if for for somebody like you, like how powerful, you know, you can code Python and you can do high content. Like that's you're like a, a magician. And then, <laughs> kind of one other little anecdotal story, I. 
I got invited to see um, the Philharmonic at the Hollywood Bowl, and it was uh, Steven Spielberg walking the audience through his, the scoring process, and it was his famous uh, um, uh, musical uh, partner. Um, here, let's pause John this. John Williams. Oh yeah, John Williams. Yeah, John yeah. Williams was with the Philharmonic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so John Williams with the Philharmonic mm -hmm. was uh, in Steven Spielberg, and they would basically like do like, okay, here's here's the 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 setting, and Steven would talk about it, and then they would play it without the music, and then they would have John Williams with the Philharmonic play it with the music. Yeah, you, mind you know, blowing, right? That contrast was amazing. The emotions, but then. Steven Spielberg's narration and his mm -hmm. command of storytelling and his ability to connect with, you know, whatever, 8,500 people at the Philharmonic and just talking. It was like one of the coolest experiences I've ever experienced because it was so meta in the context of here's this amazing yeah. director storytelling giving this really intimate context about the power of music in the context of storytelling. And then him telling the story, I, I've never heard somebody communicate as well as Steven Spielberg in that context. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's fascinating. I mean, film directors really have a tough job and the ones that are successful deserve all the credit and money and accolades and everything they get because it truly is uh, a miracle to pull off what they do, you know, because um, mm -hmm. you can't be bad at anything. You got to be good at all the things. You got to know, hey, that light is a little out of place right there. Hey, you know, you ask your gaffer, can you go change that? Or the audio doesn't seem right. Can we make sure that this is blah, blah, blah? You know, so it's one of those things where nowadays we want to fix everything in post and use AI for all this stuff, but it all stems from doing it right in camera, doing it right the first time. You know um, what I mean? So that way you don't have to worry about that stuff because, God, it sucks when you see something that was done poorly and they just tried to fix it after the fact. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, yeah, Spielberg, obviously, one of the greatest of all time. Yeah. Well, I guess kind of double-clicking into that, all the pun intended, talk to us about um, your YouTube uh, channels and how that evolved in, in, in this data channel that you're doing now. I mean, that was one of the things that really lit me up to want to invite you on the show is – I'm uh, studying for my CFA, and um, one of the modules I get to do is uh, a coding module in Python. And I was asking, yeah. like, hey, like, you know, what's the best way to learn how to do Python? And you're talking about how, you know, the, some of the AI concepts. And, um, you know, I think uh, in the context of data science, there's that famous book, How to Lie with Data, which I'm sure you've read. In how to Lie with Statistics. Uh, yeah. How to Lie with Statistics. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, so, um, yeah, talk to us about, about YouTube and all things data. Yeah. So YouTube is an interesting space. Um, the way I see success on YouTube is uh, by finding an interesting topic and then bringing your own perspective to it. So my main channel started out as me uh, trying to convince people that data was cool and you should learn it and no one cared at all. <laughs> and then I, I did a video explaining how I was saving money by owning a Tesla. And they went absolutely bananas. Like I started that week with 800 subscribers and I ended with 6,000 and just, just nuts. And so being a good data scientist, the main, one of the main ideas in, in data science is to experiment and just when something works, do more of that, right? It's pretty simple in, in concept. So I did a bunch more Tesla videos. They kept blowing up and just things went kind of gangbusters from there. And then you know, now, now that you have a, wait, have wait, a wait. ship. What, yeah. What's that channel called? That's just my main channel called Ben Sullins. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, 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 by the way, you got a new subscriber today. Yeah. <laughs> great. Great. Um, it's an interesting journey, right? Because once you find your voice, meaning you have a perspective on something that people want to listen to, um, then you then you can play with that and you can explore that you can go deeper in that so that's what i did for i mean i started my main youtube channel i guess really seriously about seven years ago now going on this is year eight and you know it was it was really exciting and fun as most skills are in the beginning right the first time you learn a new riff from a song that you like and you can it sounds just like what you heard on the album it's yeah. like it's magic right yeah. so that's how it feels and then eventually you get to the point where you're kind of bored with it or 
you want to explore, experiment, and do different things. And unfortunately, the way YouTube works is it doesn't really promote this. It doesn't really promote creativity as as an individual. It it, it promotes do the same thing that you know I, I've given you that that people want you to do and never stop. This is why probably you see this massive trend on YouTube of people quitting. So. Uh, you know, I've been doing that channel. I still uh, have changed the subject area from Tesla to other cars, other electric cars, to now home products where I'm really interested in, I don't know, all kinds of different things like uh, like uh, robots that m mow your lawn or uh, batteries that will power your home in an outage. Like you, you guys just got a bunch of rain just like we did, I think, right? And buildings are losing power everywhere. I mean, for some people, that's literally life or death. So one of those yeah. things where it's like, so I, I feel real passionate about this idea of helping people learn and and build a more resilient life at their home and for their families um, so that's you know the, the main channel shifted and it took about a, a full year of just just suck to try to get to the point now where I'm not the Tesla guy anymore um, I still get people asking me about that and that's fine I yeah. still love Tesla the products uh, I think the company has a lot of work to do and their their leader has a, has a lot of work to do on himself but point being um, pivoting away is very difficult to do uh, and I was fortunate enough because of my online courses uh, with the data science stuff that I was able to financially afford like losing my ass for a whole year on YouTube in order to get to a place where I want to be. Uh, yeah. And then in that process, uh, I, I said, okay, I, I mean, I have my online courses and now I'm publishing them on my own. So that's the Free the Data Academy. And uh, now I have my own website for that and I have my own YouTube channel. And this is a fun one because here I get to know what I know now after having you know seven years experience on the main channel and do it right on the new channel. Um, do it right as in I'm focusing it's a very business oriented thing. I want it to be entertaining and I want people to learn something and it's all within a very specific realm. And one day I could see because it's so focused on not me as as the teacher but as the topic being the interesting thing, I could see one day having other hosts on there and other people and then of potentially selling that business and letting it go. So yeah. whereas the main channel it's so tied to me and my personality and my life and all that stuff that there's no way I could ever so as a business owner it's not a good strategy. Uh but it is fun, you know. So YouTube is a very interesting place. Um, I think that it's such an amazing thing for people to find these ways to to share what they know or share their perspectives on things, to entertain people, to educate them, whatever the case may be. Um, and for me, it's it's just an ever evolving journey. Like I could see, even if I could like shut down my main channel, sell my data channel be financially set for life, I still would probably create a new channel on some other random topic that I just yeah. want to go deep on, you know, and just yeah. keep doing that over and over and over again, as long as it's interesting. But knowing now what I know about storytelling and how to create those things, I know that those things are high chance of success. Whereas early on, it's very much you're just wandering through the dark. You don't know if what you're going to do is going to lead anywhere, right? It just feels like you have no idea if you how likely it is you're going to succeed. Uh, but once you've done it a couple times, then you go, oh, okay, here's sort of the formula. As long as I stick to this, eventually I'll find I'll find the light here at the end of the tunnel. Yeah, what occurs to me is the growth mindset, uh, you know, a learning mentality. Um, the spirit of the Curdy D show is learning out loud. So I'm mm. I'm on a learning journey and bringing my audience along with me, and and uh, all the pun intended. Like you're a master class at that, and in, in <laughs> what you're doing, and it's uh, it's amazing. And I'm I am your uh, your sort of uh, kind of um, archetypical uh, audience member. You know, somebody that's getting into python and and wanting like my big challenge is with with uh with the work that we do is you know we talk to people and and uh can't talk too much about it publicly in the context of, of what we're doing with the business because we're a, a fund and we can't you know mm -hmm. talk we have to be a little careful about that but um there's a lot of times where i'll need to be able to present data and be able mm -hmm. to do it in a thoughtful way quickly and yeah uh, and yeah you know, yeah. And so Th that's a big focus of the data channel now. You know, uh, originally I, w I thought I would teach data scientists how to be professionals. So, sort of like a soft skills for data professionals, right? Mm -hmm. Turns out that, that I, I mean, some people are interested in that, but I think the broader 
uh, way I can, the, the, the bigger group of people I can help are the people that don't know data stuff, but no matter what job you're in, you're, you're going to encounter data, whether that's someone giving you some data to look at, maybe they're giving you pre a chart, maybe they're just quoting statistics. Um, knowing how to interpret that stuff, knowing the difference between an yeah. absolute difference and a, and a relative difference can really make a big difference in, in how you understand what the message that's coming across. So that's where the focus has been lately. You know, it's fun with all these AI tools, seeing how they can affect and, and help us, like you're talking about writing Python. I'm so lazy nowadays. I just ask ChatGPT to do this for me, or now Microsoft has Copilot. So, so many ways to kind of short circuit that, but knowing how to use them and knowing how to interpret things is still like, like this is what I was talking to my wife about this the other day, because she's a photographer and she sort of hates how AI has taken over photography, where I can just say, give me an image of this. And she's like, yeah. wow, that would that would have taken a whole crew of people, you know, weeks to put together and tens of thousands of dollars just to get that one image and here you are just asked it but the point is is that a person that knows say storytelling techniques or how to make data visualizations that are perceived effectively is more of a human psychology that you're working with less of a technical expertise so if you think about like how to do something ai tools can help you accomplish that but I'll guarantee you, if you had all the AI tools in the world, you still wouldn't make a uh, make a movie like Pulp Fiction, right? You, Quentin Tarantino, his skill isn't in the in the how; it, it it's in the why. Like like why are the stories told in this way? Yeah. So so getting to the human psychology of it and educating people on, on that, I think then the tools can really shine because if you're asking. ChatGPT to write Python for you, and I am, as someone that knows Python, I probably will have a leg up because I know exactly what to be asking of it. And so I think that's the focus on the data channel now is how are all these new tools going to work, but also what are the, the kind of core skills that fundamentally don't change? You know, over time, um, how we perceive there are like six different attributes that we perceive in terms of data visualizations. How we perceive those doesn't change in human evolution very often, right? Like we evolved to notice color, for example, bright colors indicate something to pay attention to. Why is that? Well, in nature, that could be a poisonous frog that we want to avoid, or it could be a really sweet fruit that we want to eat because sugar is good for us, right? And we need it for energy. So what, how, how we perceive color is something that's evolved for hundreds of thousands, millions of years, not something that ChatGPT invented. So when it comes to, let's say, creating a data visualization, creating an effective one requires that you understand the fundamentals of how humans perceive color and shape and size and position on page and all the other attributes that make a data visualization. So I think that there's so much that people can learn that is, I don't want to say non-technical, but it, but is is you know more fundamental than yeah. how do, how do I create a beautiful chart or something like that? Yeah, back to uh, the Jack Dangerman story, the the founder and CEO at Esri, uh, the you know he basically pioneered digital mapping uh, mm -hmm. out of the design school at Harvard in the late '60s. He studied with Buckminster Fuller, and he's gone on to you know. Trailblaze is a whole uh, in industry that so much of even Google Maps is sort of a, a derivative of it. And um, mm -hmm. one of the things that uh, I learned from him that it gets referenced on the show all the time is this idea of being above the line. And so context, mm -hmm. he says, is above the line and content is below the line. And mm -hmm. there's there's all kinds of like profound biological um, insights around this about like, you know, the survival instinct is sort of below the line that animal that mm -hmm. stimulates its function and kind of being kind of uh, uh, creative and imaginative is above the line not r responsive versus reactive mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. and so that's a theme that that uh that just keeps coming up over and over again on the show in the in this context all the pun intended and another thing that i learned working at esri with the mapping bit that really is so resonant to what you said is this concept of see, feel, change. Mm -hmm. And when we see something, it creates an emotion that gives us some yeah. conviction to go and make a decision or an action. And I think that's really the insight 
uh, and the power of data visualization. And and it's and it can be used for for good and for bad. Like that book we were referencing, How to Lie with Statistics. Yeah. You know. Yeah, there's a great example if people want to search this or if you guys want to try to find the graphic uh, called Anscombe's Quartet. Have you heard of this? I have not. So uh, I think it's Francis Anscombe. Someone correct me. But um, Anscombe's Quartet is this uh, statistician that I think it was an economist, but same, same, uh, came up with this this idea of sort of why visualizing data is important. And he had four different data sets and they were X, Y coordinates, right? Just just kind of random numbers, it seemed. And they were all different. So it's not like they all match some pattern or anything like that. But there were four different sets of X and Y uh, variables. And if you do summary statistics on them, the, the mean, the variance, all this kind of stuff, it was almost exact. So all the numbers, when you look at them, it looks like a bunch of random numbers. But when you do the summary stuff on them, the statistics, it's almost identical. And so you could, you could, you know, be forgiven if you assumed that these were all the same story, the meaning behind these numbers were all the same. And then when you visualize this data, it just comes to life and it shows you how wildly different each story of those coordinates is. And so you can imagine like, uh, 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 you know, we're in the NFL playoffs right now, uh, a sports team going to win whatever the, the highest level is, the NBA finals or Super Bowl or something like that. How the team that wins, if all you cared about were the summary statistics, you may say, oh, they won or lost. But the journey to get there is what makes a season magical. That's what makes sports magical. And the reason it's magical is because of the, the feeling and the story that was, that, that was led up to that point. So I think data visualization is one of those things where it really goes to our human psychology, where if I, if I understand right, if the research that I've read is correct, our visual perception system is the fastest and most effective system in our brain. So, you know, auditory mm. versus visual and all this yep. and touch, all of our senses, our visual one is the, it, like, before you, you re recognize that there was a dot on the page colored differently than everything else, and you're, before you recognize that I should look at that, your brain is already looking at it. So the actual information is being processed faster through your visual perception system than anything else. Yeah. So that explains why. And the Anscombe's Quartet is a great example of that, where if a computer were to look at that, it may assume that these are all basically the same. But when you visualize it, you go, oh, wow, look at how wildly different each one of these data sets is. Mm -hmm. And so data visualization is a thing where if you're on the receiving end, like forget if you want to make charts and, and present information this way, which I think is a skill many, many people can, can use. Um, if you just even are receiving data in this format, you have to be aware that there may be some subconscious things here. There may be some some elements of this display that are tricking you into a conclusion that may not be accurate. And so what I'm trying to help people understand on my data channel is when and where you should pay attention to those things. Like if somebody gets rid of uh, on a y-axis of a line chart, if, if it doesn't start at zero, why doesn't it start at zero? Mm -hmm. Right. So a salesperson may may show up a th uh, may show a chart that and they got rid of the sale the the y axis starting starting at zero, and it may look like oh my god look at sales they're just skyrocketing, but the reality is is if you based it at zero it's like they're pretty much flat. Yeah. Right. So you can sort of lie with not just statistics but charts as well. So if you're the a billionaire founder owner of a company it is like critically important that when you someone shows you something that you know how to perceive it correctly and ask questions like why didn't you base this at zero why is it based at whatever you know and then in other times maybe that that'd be the a difference between an absolute versus a relative difference maybe in other times the the relative difference is what you want to see so a good example would be say usain bolt breaking the world record for the 100 meters well People would say he smashed that record. Oh my God, he completely obliterated it. Right, by like two tenths of a second or something, right? So mm -hmm. if you saw a, a line chart of the world record, whatever, the absolute difference, if it was based in zero, would look would look like nothing. It would look like a completely flat line practically. But in this context, a relative difference where you show the actual, you know, not based on zero, the relative difference is massive. So... There may be times when, and that's where you need to know what you're looking at. You know, is this 
ho hum, whatever, or is this something where I really need to to pay attention to? And yeah, that's the skills yeah. I think we all need. Yeah, and in the context of my CFA studies, I'm the more I learn, the more I realize how complex the system is, and it's mm -hmm. incredibly. Anybody that tells you that they could forecast uh, what's on deck is, you know, full of crap. Uh, yeah, well, it's always tough. Big. Yeah. Yeah. It, you know, it's funny forecasting. You can sort of get the broad strokes right, but the specifics of it are always almost impossible to get. Yeah. I mean, this is why when you look at the weather, uh, it, you know, we can only predict the weather three days out, really. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. Four or five days, it gets real fuzzy. Beyond that, just forget it. It's just you're going mm -hmm. to national averages. Yeah, um, but then there are these guys, like the guys at Renaissance, um, they're a, a, a trading firm out of New York, and they're getting like 60% annualized returns consistently, and they've pioneered this whole big data approach. And I, I've talked to some really smart people, and it sounds like they've discovered some signals that allow them to do that. And, you know, over time, the, I'm sure that edge gets arbitrate, you know, arbitraged out or, you know, people figure that out. So, yeah, there may be know. some sort of cracks and seams that they're exploiting mm -hmm. of the way, but if they just continue, you know, this is how Bernie Madoff got caught. If they just keep going forever and it's always up and to the right, like if you ever saw the testimony of the guys that, that caught Bernie Madoff, it's like, there's, it's impossible. It's like yeah, statistically yeah. It impossible. Perfectly smooth linear <laughs> chart. It was, I don't remember. I saw that documentary. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, you're just looking at it going, well, that's not how yeah. this works. There's no possible way for yeah. him to always get those exact consistent results. It's impossible. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so that's how they figured out it was, it was for fraud, you know? So mm -hmm. anytime you see that stuff, you got to be, be aware, right. Of, of what it is you're looking at, because there's, there's no, Anything like that that's too good to be true probably yeah. is, you know, maybe in the yeah. short term I think in the context that works. Of I think those guys are kind of a little bit more, you know, working uh, above the line in the context of they're on the radar and people mm -hmm. know about them. It's, it wasn't like it was a, but uh, yeah, I guess, um, uh, Eliza, let's edit that little bit out. That was a little distracting. Um, uh, so is there any, if it, Somebody comes to the YouTube channel. What what YouTube channel is the data one that you'd recommend? Uh, or that uh, you're talking about? Yeah, it's Free the Data Academy is the channel. Okay. Um, and that's where I'm trying to really just, you know, teach people and educate them how to perceive data, how to use data, how to how to create things. Uh, like my next video coming out is about um, Copilot versus ChatGPT to write SQL code for you. Uh, and I just put them through several tests. I asked them to write code in different scenarios and see what they come out with and then sort of evaluate how it worked and which one did better yeah. and that kind of a thing. So, you know, helping people at that level that are actually writing SQL understand what's going on um, all the way to yeah, like storytelling techniques and how to give more effective presentations. So still trying to find it. exactly who the right audience is there, but all in that realm of like just being more effective with data. Yeah, I'm on, I, I, I'm on the channel now. I just subscribed. Um, looks like, yeah, you're, you got a, a nice little community building. Where is there any videos here you'd recommend people to, to start with? I see the Data 101. Um, is there, if, if people wanted to go on a journey here, where would you recommend they start? Yeah, there there should be, if there's not now, a, a playlist. Um, you know, maybe the for oh, yeah. people listening to this, yeah, yeah th there's like a, is, is there a podcast section? Does that make it to there? Because we um, did a podcast for a couple seasons where we interviewed people yeah. that were uh, sort of leaders in the data and AI space. And so that'd be a good one for, I think, people. And there's all different topics from financial analysts to storytelling stuff to uh, sort of, you know, AI and big data and all that kind of different, different oh, stuff. Yeah. So, yeah, we got your free the data podcast season one season two and then there's mm -hmm. all these different topics from career advice di digital visualization interview tips uh python i want to definitely dig into the python uh this is yeah. amazing political races i think that's probably pretty pretty uh, uh appropriate into 2024 yeah yeah that, that's what you know i was trying to I, I try to balance it out and this is if you listen to some of the more creator youtube you know educators out there they talk about balancing um you know, sort of your internal versus external videos. So your internal would be the people that already know you, already subscribe. So those people, they're the ones that are going to want to learn Python. And then every now and then, maybe once a month or so, I'll do a video that's more externally focused. So uh, like I just did one recently, um, oh, a couple months ago, about daylight savings. 
and I talked about sort of, you know, the, the implications of daylight savings, and I use data to explain that, looking at charts and graphs. And so if you're seeing that video, you may just be interested in daylight savings, but then I sort of reel you in with that, and then I hit you with the data before. So by the end of the video, hopefully you're like, wow, it's actually really interesting looking at data behind things. Maybe mm -hmm. there's stuff on this channel that I want to go deeper in. So... If someone's new coming to it and they already know the context of it, probably the podcast is a good place because it's these really in-depth conversations about data stuff. Um, but then when I have sort of these external videos about, yeah, political races or I mm -hmm. used to do some stuff about uh, COVID statistics because I started this channel back during uh, when COVID was really hot because I was – back then I was really thinking about, man, you know, there's so much – unknowns at the time in the world of COVID back when we were right in the middle of it. And I kept seeing charts and graphs and all kinds of, I don't know if they're intentionally, you know, trying to deceive people, but information that I felt wasn't being presented in the right way. So I was like, okay, well, let's, let's do something here and let's try to do it in a way that I know to be more true and representative. Forget the motivations of, of different parties and whatever they may be let's look at what the data is telling us and then maybe we that'll help inform people so you know again trying to explore the world through the lens of data um and then educate people those that do want to join the party and and actually learn how to use this stuff and, and and how to how to handle data in a better way yeah real quickly i want to get into the um humanizing success question and i i want to sure. be sensitive of time but to double click into this and back to the problem that i'm trying to solve uh, increasingly in, in this idea of uh, Microsoft Copilot. Uh, most of us uh, in the business world use Excel. Um, what, mm -hmm. What's your thoughts about uh, any sort of pro tips on how to experiment with using um, Copilot to data visualize any Excel data? And do you have any sort of videos? Uh, it sounds like you have a whole uh, bit of content on deck for this, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm working on that stuff right now because Copilot's been sort of in beta and behind a lot of different walls. And so now it seems like it's actually coming out, which is mm -hmm. pretty cool. And it's being embedded, of course, in all the Microsoft uh, stuff, you know, from the Office suite to all their other tools and platforms. Uh, it, it's really cool for, from what I've been playing with. And I, I really think they're they're crushing it. Microsoft has completely done a 180, I feel like, with their brand uh, back when me and you first remember them to be... Yeah. Totally in a row. Lame, I, you know, I yeah. Or up and down, I would never use another Microsoft instance again. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I could just got, I mean, when I was at Esri, we used Microsoft and it was like, you know, it, being able to work on Google with like sheets and docs yeah. and everything was yeah. linked. And, and, uh, my, my business partner at real world, uh, is an analyst and he's, you know, lives and dies out of Excel. And, Yep. We tried to use Sheets and, and it just it broke. And so we, we doubled down on Microsoft, basically hoping that uh, the AI bit would come true. Uh, we had some good insight there. And, and I've been, you know, we just set up a SharePoint instance and we're using Teams. And, yeah. you know, it, it's, it, the, the way they do things is different. But now that, I'm, now that everything's web enabled and, and shareable, I'm, uh, I'm, I would agree. I'm, I, they've sort of uh, converted me to be a fan again, which I thought I'd never say. This is what happens when you put a developer in charge of a tech company, right? With Satya Nadella, this is his influence, I would say. The brand is much more attractive now The from the UI that they have with Windows 10 and, and, and beyond um, to the tools and how they actually work. I mean, Microsoft's always had a lot of really solid, good technology. I mean, Excel is arguably the greatest piece of software ever created besides maybe yeah. the internet browser or something um, in terms of impact on the world. Like I still guess that, you know, OPEC is sitting around deciding the world's oil prices and production with a pivot table. Like I guarantee they're just clicking around with some unpaid intern uh, figuring out how, 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 <laughs> how the world's oil supply works. But with that, yeah, the Microsoft stuff and their their focus on AI with their investments in open AI specifically have are really showing uh, the, the bearing fruit right now. Um, I feel like Google, ironically, is really falling behind in, in this way. I mean, Bard uh, is, is in, I think, what, Gemini and these other ones. They're, they're certainly not at the level of ChatGPT or open AI stuff. And then Microsoft is probably a close second right now. But Microsoft's advantage, of course, is their embeddedness in the, the corporate world. Yeah. Uh, it's it's impossible to displace them from, yeah. from you know, 90% of companies out there. Yeah, that makes uh, sense. Yeah, leverage you know, the system of record and, and 
extend that value chain. I mean, it's, yeah. it's the strategy is, uh, it's picking up new customers. Uh, yeah. So that's great. So um, copilot in Excel, I'll just wrap up copilot yeah. in Excel. Fantastic. Um, the, the tool, the ways I've been seeing use it, you have a data set, you ask it to create something. It, it, it creates it. It creates charts for you. I will say, though, that the ChatGPT data analyst plugin on the ChatGPT Plus is better at creating charts, in my experience, than Copilot is as of this recording. And so okay. what's, cool, what's cool about that is you could take your Excel sheet, give it to upload it to ChatGPT and ask questions of it. I've actually done a few videos on this and Great. it's kind of kind of mind blowing. This was before um Copilot was really out. So Copilot like wasn't in the picture back then, but I've done it done it several times where I said, "Okay, here's a data set and I had a friend create charts in Tableau, which is another great data visualization yep. platform, and send his data visualizations to me and me try to recreate them with the ChatGPT da data analyst thing, and it was shocking how good it is." Um, and it even will give you the Python code to go recreate it yourself. So this is where I think as a data analyst, you can no longer ignore these tools. Uh, you can think all, you know, this is where maybe you're talking above the line, below the line, like knowing what type of data visualization would be good in a given context to explain something is what you need to know how to actually create it say in excel which excel is is you know not very good in terms of data visualization capabilities it can do simple stuff but power bi on the microsoft stack is very good power bi also has a copilot plugin um i mean all this stuff it's just going to be really fascinating where what what your skills are going to be down the road is knowing what are the right questions to ask not how to click and build the thing itself. The how yeah. is going to be completely automated, which I think is great because it'll get get us all more productive and becoming more effective in whatever our, you know, industry is. What do you think about um Tableau as a as a you think they're I'm going to look up their stock price right now. I'm looking at Alteryx. Well, they're, Alteryx, yeah. Yeah, yeah Alteryx is an interesting one. Um Tableau for a long time was sort of like all roads lead to Tableau. Yeah. Didn't matter who you were, what you did, eventually you were going to get it. It was just the best thing on the planet. I will say that that their their Power BI has really eaten a lot of their lunch. Um, and Power BI integrated with everything else is hard to beat, especially since most companies are already paying for it. It's already included in your office and SQL Server licensing and whatever else you pay for. So it's one of those things where I think Tableau initially just absolutely dominated and changed the landscape. In fact, things like uh, Power BI wouldn't exist if Tableau didn't just come along and just disrupt the whole industry. So absolutely, uh, it's still a tremendous tool. When Salesforce bought them, I think I and a lot of other fans were kind of bummed uh, because you know what was coming. It was going to be the more yeah. corporatization of it, the slower yeah. pace of innovation. Uh, a friend of mine, just he was the chief product officer at Tableau. He just left. Uh, so you're looking at it going, oh, man, I don't know what their future holds, uh, but the product, I would say, is still incredibly good. Uh, probably overkill for a lot of companies if you already have P Power BI because that does a lot of the same things and it's easier and cheaper. So, you know, they're going to have a tough road ahead, but I certainly think it's a great piece of software. Yeah, I don't know a lot. I know Alteryx. Is that how you say it? Alteryx. Alteryx. Yeah. They had a pretty big growth spurt hired a lot of people and a lot of people bailed and uh it's it just feels to me intuitively that 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 they're going to have a real big challenge with uh the market alterix yeah. uh i don't i haven't followed them in a little while i was actually on their podcast uh, many moons ago and they back then it was all about just um, so in the process of data science or data analytics, whatever you want to call it, it's all about like taking data and then making sense of it. And the raw data coming from different applications, right? So if you think of your HR app, your your website, your CRM, whatever, all these different channels where the data is generated and created, you have to kind of call all that together into a place to ask holistic questions about it. This is data warehousing, right? Or data marts and star schemas and these things. So Alteryx was sort of the tableau of how to get the data from wherever into a place that you could then ask questions of it. And a lot of people would then, you know, just do all of the question asking in Alteryx as well. And so then instead of being a complement to Tableau, they started competing with Tableau. And so I think you had people kind of go different ways on that. I think now Tableau also has a data prep tool, which does 
basically everything mm-hmm. Alteryx does. And yeah. if you're a mic, and if you're a Microsoft shop, I mean, they have Power Automate oh, power, and they yeah, have a yeah. bunch of other tools that do mm-hmm. all this. Plus, not to mention just SQL Server. They've been around forever, yeah. and they have a whole suite uh, of tools that have been doing this for many, many years now. So, Alteryx's future, I'm not sure. I, I, I'm not super in tune with what their product strategy is now. Yeah. Um, they did hit a real sweet spot for a few years, I know. And then I think when they started to try to compete with Tableau, things se- appeared to slow down from my perspective. Yeah, I have friends of mine that work for the big five, you know, McKinsey and Bain, and they all love all tricks. You know, they kind of mm-hmm. live on that kind of thick client app, but it'll yeah. be interesting to see what happens. Uh, with, it, with all what stuff. it did, yeah. what all tricks did is sort of what Tableau did. They sort of democratized this ability to bring data sources together and apply some logic to them and create that sort of um, information layer, right? So pre- previously, in order to do that, you had to be a coder or at least know SQL Server stuff, write SQL code, use integration services, use some of these other tools. Or if you're on the bigger tech companies that don't use Microsoft stuff, like at Facebook when I was there, uh, we use MicroStrategy for everything. And so anyways, there's lots of different tools and ways that this has been happening. But then now you could just be an Excel jockey and you could do some stuff that was definitely above your pay grade in terms of bringing different data sources together where previously that was sort of relegated to the data team. And so Alteryx was trying to democratize it just like Tableau did with creating all these really advanced, sophisticated data visualizations. I think the challenge is, is that companies maybe realize that that can be problematic. Maybe for a consulting company, it's fine because I can just go into a new client, get all their data, bring it together, come up with some insight. But if you're bringing, if you're trying to build institutional knowledge and systems that are reliable and stand the test of time, you yeah. can't have just hundreds of people coming up with different versions of the truth. It doesn't work that way. Yeah. Uh, they can come up with their answer for their problem, and Alteryx is maybe a great tool for that. But I still think that the proper strategy for the bigger companies or more the more serious decisions uh, need to have some sort of centralized sort of method and control, which is unfortunately not going to be done by the analyst. It's going to be done by somebody with, you know, deeper technical expertise on the data team. Yeah. I mean, then the, that all roads and then lead back to Microsoft because if you have the SQL and then Excel, which is essentially a, a data visualization and data management application of SQL. And then you mm-hmm. have, yeah, you know, yeah, the, and, and now you can do Python and SQL natively in Excel. So Excel is becoming, Excel has come into the sort of the, the big data leagues now. It's really trying to punch above its weight class, I feel, in terms of what you can do, which is really cool. I'm so happy that Python's in Excel. I don't think anyone's going to use it <laughs> because yeah. it's just, it's like, hey, you know Excel, now go learn this programming language, which is totally foreign to you. It's like, no, I think I'm just going to use Tableau or Power BI. Like, that's so much mm-hmm. easier to just grab yeah. my Excel data and create charts versus like mm-hmm. learning how to write Python code to create a chart. Like, that doesn't seem like it makes sense for most people. But if you're like a more data science focused person and you're a coder already, super cool that you can do more advanced things in Excel with Python now. Yeah. And you know, we just migrated to my, uh, the SharePoint sites. And so we can. You know, it all it all it underpins Teams and all the yep. Office 365 applications, Word, Excel, et cetera. Yep. And then, um, you know, we can, you know, create these uh, sites, which essentially, you know, you can do email. You know, I mean, all kinds of permissions. We're organizing everything by function, so like, you know, sales, mm-hmm. marketing, operations, et cetera. And then, uh, yeah, you can do the the you have the the um, teams where you could direct message and we're really trying to reduce email and just be able to build the institutional knowledge as we go and not have stuff siloed. And then you can then use SharePoint, which was really originally designed for these wiki sites and then Mm -hmm. organize the very best of these channels into like, you which are like topic hubs that we could then build out some um, standard operating procedures and, you know, all kinds of wikis. And so I can just see the, uh, the AI on top of it. If it's this Microsoft is just all integrated. Um, so, yeah, I guess. Yeah, the, uh, the co-pilot stuff is going to be, uh, have a, a very unique advantage in that it's your uh, AI. It, it's your data that it's reading from. So you create mm-hmm. these wiki pages and all this. You can feed that into it and it can learn you and your company. 
uh, ChatGPT or Google Bard or these other external ones, it's just not going to have that institutional knowledge, that domain-specific knowledge mm -hmm. for your company. So I think Microsoft yeah. is just going to dominate there. The only time it wouldn't is if you're, let's say, Apple and you don't use, well, it's funny, Apple does use Microsoft stuff, but if they don't use SharePoint, which I doubt they do, then it wouldn't work, right? So most companies that have Microsoft stuff use Teams and all these other things. I think Copilot is going to dominate because it has that, Mm -hmm. what you've given it, whereas these other external ones may actually be better at certain tasks, but it's not going to know you. And so yes. I don't think it'll ever be as good. Yeah. I mean, we're using um, some of the AI, the, the GPT and the BARD to even help us think through our, our storytelling and objection mm -hmm. handling. And it's just incredible how I find that the, the AI helps me um, to expand my mind and get over the sort of that resistance of, of, of creating and helping mm -hmm. me go faster, which feeds on itself. And yeah, it's, it's just remarkable. I mean, we're, I, 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 any, and that's why I'm doing this series to just help kind of bring people along and kind of share the good news that there's a brand new day of creativity on the horizon and it's here. Yeah. The future is now. Well, and you can learn so much. Like I think the future of online learning will be, almost entirely driven by these large language models where you have, you know, like what I'm trying to teach, which are the above the line stuff, the the context of it, the why do people like these things? Well, it's human psychology, it's evolution, there's all these reasons behind it. Um, but then mechanistically, how do you go about that? That's where it'll just be, that's mm -hmm. the easy part. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, like think about building websites, right? If you're a, a, a HTML, CSS, JavaScript developer, you're a front end web developer, that job it will be almost completely gone in the future. You'll just ask a large language model to create this website for you, and there it goes. In fact, you can already do that, right? You can already ask ChatGPT or Copilot or Bar to create a landing page for my uh, coffee mug company, and it will just create everything for you. You pay, copy paste the code. You don't have to know it. Maybe you have to know how to fix it, but it's it's one of those things where I think. Um, the the important skills of the future aren't going to be on the execution side. They're going to be on the why side, the the context yeah. side of it, yeah. and that's where everyone really needs to to advance. I love it. I love it. Um, we're way over time. I want to be sensitive. Do you have another minute? <clears throat> yeah, yeah. All right. So for the audience, um, it's uh, typically I would ask a, a humanizing success prompt and. Um, what I would encourage in the, in, for two reasons, for the sake of time, but also to, to, to share the awesomeness of your uh, uh, YouTube is to encourage um, folks to go to your YouTube page, Ben Sullins, uh, S-U-L-L-I-N-S. And you do, a, there's a kind of a explainer video that you get really honest about your uh, kind of journey into this and how you kind of lost it. You know, no, you didn't, I don't know if you lost a job or there was something that happened and you kind of back to your three act thing. And, yeah. and uh, um, you want to give a real quick little context about that and then we can wrap up. Yeah. Yeah. So the idea and, and what you'll see in that video is sort of setting the stage for that YouTube channel as to why, uh, I'm doing what I'm doing on there and what people will get out of it, right? Because I, mm -hmm. I feel like YouTube channels are almost like TV shows. And so imagine if your favorite TV show all of a sudden switched from, uh, you know, House Hunters to uh, Top Chef. You'd be like, what the hell is this? You know, it's different, right? So the, the context of that channel is... Uh, about protecting my family and you know I'm a father and a husband and all that and so it's just sort of in my DNA to want to make sure that everyone's safe and so I figured out how to do this through a lot of trial and error and it all stemmed from a power outage that my family had many years ago where I mean people laugh that oh it was so cold in San Diego like it can get cold here like and when you have a newborn yeah. if your house is 45 degrees that newborn doesn't give a crap and yeah. so what can we do to protect ourselves and our families and and then what have I learned throughout this process because I feel like I sort of organically started to drift towards this idea of, of what I'm calling a bulletproof life. And and then I started to experiment and then throughout that process was able to actually learn a lot and implement these things. And so that's what the channel was all about was how do I actually do that? Well, you know, one is you make a power plant at your house, right? I can put solar panels up and have a battery. Now, if the grid goes down, I don't care 
if they jack up the electricity rates, I don't care. Like I am in control of my own destiny when it comes to that. Then I need to switch everything over to run on my energy that I make. So if you have a gas furnace and the gas goes out or if you have a gas leak, now you don't have heat. That's not okay. So we need to switch everything over to run on the energy that we ourselves create. And then what about transportation? Same thing. So electric cars. You know, if the, there's a gas shortage, like we've seen several times, um, I don't care. If Saudi Arabia wants to say no more gas for you and the gas price is 10x, it doesn't matter. I make my own fuel. You know, so there's all these themes and in, 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 in all these lessons and I'm just trying to experiment and be humble and learn along this process of what I can do to protect my family and provide them with a more resilient life. And so that's what I'm sharing on that main channel is is how can we actually all do that? What lessons can we take? Sometimes it's it doesn't work, other times it does, but it's a journey and I just wanna share that with people so everyone else can kind of live and, and have a more resilient future uh, than, than what we have now. I love that. I love the bulletproof life. We had a desert house out in Joshua Tree uh, that we we quarantined in. When I when I bought it, I was like, you know, five percent chance I can have this place as a bug out, and it's you know close enough that I could drive there on a half tank of gas. Yeah. And sure enough, you know, we were living in Venice, and the COVID happened, and it got kind of sketchy. So we went we quarantined out in the desert on five acres, and it was incredible. Yeah. And right. that really got me, you know, just thinking more about this. I love the idea of a bulletproof life. I think that's, uh, I think that it speaks to sovereignty and, and I think yeah. it's to, and, you uh, know, originally, and even on comments, it, it can be on the internet. People can perceive this as like some, uh, woke tree hugger, vegan ism kind of thing. But really when you get to the root of all this, it's about freedom and independence, Yeah, you know? So it's kind of funny how, politically people can view it however they want to view things it's like people perceive things how they want to but when you get to the root of it i think we all can agree on these things like it's better to be free and independent and sustainable sustainable not in the sense of like less carbon going into the atmosphere but sustainable as in like i make my own water like if the water goes bad i don't care i we yeah. will still have water at my house that's yeah. that's hard not many people can say that but living in the southwest this is something that i think we're going to come have to come to terms with in the near future so being energy independent being independent of the water source being independent of all these things the only thing i haven't figured out yet is septic like if you have your house in joshua tree you could install a septic system but you know if you live in venice it's not really possible to do that but yeah. you know how how can we live in a more in a way that's more resilient and i think everybody can get behind these ideals and then they actually lead to benefits across no matter where you sit on the political spectrum all the benefits i think uh, i think are, are are appreciated you know like my dad out in arizona you know he wants an electric truck not because he thinks or cares that his truck is causing harm to the planet but it's just way better and, you know it's just it can tow more it's faster it can do more than his so i think that if we can set aside our differences in in, in this way and focus on these other themes of being more self-sustainable and self-reliant we can all achieve our goals and so that's what the idea behind a bulletproof life is is to find a way yeah. that we can come together with these things because it's all yeah. just we're all human and we all just want to we all just want to be fat and happy <laughs> really i think the resilient the this kind of idea of resilience relates to that because it's it's a it's an ecological framework. It's uh, it's decentralized, and you're not you you know you you have optionality, and you're not dependent. You could still you could still use the grid, but you can sure. opt out of it too. So you know, you, I think that's the that's the magic where you yeah. And it's so cool because we have so many products in this space that are coming out from people that can afford to have a giant. Tesla battery mounted to their wall and just be off grid to people that live in condos. And, you know, you can only have a, a trash can size battery that you put in there in case of an outage. You can keep your internet going, mm. your fridge going, things like that, you know? Yeah. And then you have, of course, people that have medical uh, challenges, right? People that, that literally need power. Otherwise, you know, they could be facing a life or death situation. So I think that there's, there's a lot to it. And fortunately, there's a lot of money to be made. And anytime there's money to be made, there are companies there to find solutions. And so yeah. that's what's really fun about this is that I get to explore these things and I get to share them with people in a way that I think is authentic and real and, you know, something that we can all get behind. Um, two, I love it. I'm incredible. I'm, I'm inspired. And, uh, we've been looking at getting Tesla solar at the house. And I think you just put me over the line to get it done. And by the way, I priced it out and Tesla was the cheapest and they, everybody yeah. said their customer, all the other competitors, Sunrun, oh, 
don't be careful with Tesla. Their customer service sucks. And I found that their customer service was the best. It's all like text based. You can get a hold of somebody. It's really efficient. So mm -hmm. I don't know. I, mean, I, I would I would get a quote from Tesla, and I would also recommend people check out EnergySage.com. So Energy okay. Sage is a, a marketplace for getting solar bids on your house. So you mm -hmm. go, you upload your info, you do all this. It doesn't share your personal info with any of the people bidding on your project. Mm -hmm. um, but then, so they each bid without knowing, without being able to spam you and call you and show up at your house. And mm -hmm. then um, it'll show they have a dashboard that shows you the price per watt, the warranty of each inverter, the types and all this stuff. So even if you don't know any of that stuff now, it sort of educates you. And that's how mm -hmm. I learned. Actually, I used them yeah. many when I got solar in my old house. And so it's one of those things like, yeah, I always recommend you check out the independent providers like a Sunrun and a Tesla who are not going to be on Energy Sage. And then you go on Energy Sage and then you can kind of break it all down and just understand mm -hmm. it. It's a great way. Um, and right now, when, you know, springtime's coming. Uh, now is a good time to get it done because then this summer, you know, is when you're going to get yeah. the most uh, yeah. energy. So, yeah, I love that. Yeah, um, highly recommended. Two real quick uh, wrap up questions. Um, you've been able. Speaking of, of Tesla, you've you've met Elon Musk a couple times, right? Uh, met him once. Uh, had yeah. one conversation with him over the phone. Um, yeah. yeah. What was that like? Interesting guy. Um, kind of reminds me of like like when I met Mark Zuckerberg back when I worked at Facebook. Uh, you, you have a perception of who they are, and then the reality is quite different. Mm -hmm. um, like, for example, uh, neither of those guys I would want to go have a beer with. <laughs> you know, they're just super socially awkward and, you know, on a different planet. Um, so in, interesting, uh, but not at all what I expected. Yeah, fair. Um, if you could have any band, you're a musician, you, mm -hmm. you play flamenco. If you could have any band, artist, singer, songwriter, instrumentalist play any venue in the mm. world, past, present, or future, who would it be and where? Oh, wow. Um, could I do the Beatles at the Red Rocks? All day long. It'd be for could your birthday, bro. Or your wife's <laughs> birthday. <laughs> that would be an amazing one. Um, yeah. And it's funny. I'm not just, I'm not the hugest Beatles fan. I just know that show that they put on in like the late sixties, early seventies or whatever is one of the most iconic of all time. So, you know, I, that, that may be what I'd go with. Yeah. The, maybe in the future you could help keep an eye out for me. I, I asked this question as a little bit of a fantasy that maybe one day I can deliver through AI back to all my uh, guests <laughs> that I've asked the question, that experience for them in a kind of a virtual reality kind of thing. Yeah. I, well, I hear the the best thing right now is the sphere in Las Vegas. Uh, I've had a few friends that have went and saw U2 yeah. there and neither of them are like the biggest U2 fans, but they're like, of course they know how to put, a, put on a good show and the venue is just out of this world. So maybe that's, uh, it, when the Curdy D show gets you know gigantic, we'll, we'll ha have a live episode there with uh, with with the band playing or something. I, I love it. I love it. Uh, if people want to get a, get a hold of you, what are the obviously you got your uh, free to the data free the data academy for data geeks? Subscribe to that on YouTube and also Ben Sullen's channel um, on YouTube. Is there any uh, as far as Instagram or Twitter that you prefer? Uh, th that, that's really it. Uh, I, I don't actually do social media much. Um, mm -hmm. so I'm not on Twitter. I deleted that account like four years ago and have never been happier. Um, and then Instagram, I'm on there. If people want to DM me, but I don't really check it that often. Uh, yeah. my, my team has been posting, we've been doing a lot of short content for YouTube. And so we've been reposting that on Facebook and Instagram and, uh, mm -hmm. a, a TikTok thing too, but I don't check any of those. So yeah. the best way, if you ever want to reach out is to go to the YouTube channel, you can find my email through there or just drop a comment and you know, I'll see it probably. Awesome. Ben, it, it's amazing to be able to spend some time. Thanks for going a little bit long. I know I learned a ton and I know a lot of other people are going to be pretty fired up about this episode. And uh, Awesome. Thanks, man. You know, Thanks for having me. You're, you're a, a scholar, a gentleman, and a renaissance <laughs> man going, going deep. So I hope I, I'm looking forward to hanging out and spending some more time with you. And uh, thanks again. Absolutely. My pleasure. Thanks again to Ben Solens for being our guest. I'm so excited to continue to track Ben's mission to make us smarter. And if your growth mindset loves data too, then I encourage you to follow Ben on YouTube. Follow me, Curdy D, on Twitter and Instagram. Also, Kurt Derdix on LinkedIn. If the content moved you, please do give us a rating and review. And until next time, Curdy D loves you. <laughs>